So good morning. And thank you for being so prompt. Uh, my name is Frank Sisson. Uh, I'm the director of the Peter Yatsik Center for Ukrainian Historical Research uh, at the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies of the University of Alberta. And in addition to that mouthful, uh, I'm also the head of the executive committee of the Holodomor Research and Education Consortium, uh, which is a project uh, of the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies uh, and is funded by generous support uh, of the Temerte Foundation. Uh, our conference, Genocide in 20th Century History, the Power and, the prob and Problems of an Interpretive, Ethical, Political, and Legal Concept, uh, is co-sponsored by uh, our consortium, the Institute for Holocaust, Genocide, and Memory Studies, University of Massachusetts, the Petro Yatsik Program for the Study of Ukraine at the Center for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies here at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. By the way, they have just uh, extended their name to make life more complicated for us, of the University of Toronto, the Anne uh, Tannenbaum Center for Jewish Studies of the University of Toronto, and the Chair of Ukrainian Studies of the University of Toronto. Uh, I'd fir first like to ask uh, the Dean of Arts of the University of Alberta, uh, Dr. Leslie Cormack to greet you. Thank you very much, Frank. It's, it is a delight to be here uh, on behalf of the Faculty of Arts at the University of Alberta uh, to welcome you to at least the, the, the portion of the conference that we, we have uh, been responsible for, which is a large one because you'll, you'll see many, you'll, you'll see the uh, uh, Holodomor Research and Education Consortium, very much front and center here. Uh, the, 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 the Canadian Institute for Ukrainian Studies, which is housed in the Faculty of Arts, is a very important uh, national center uh, that supports and encourages research into all aspects of Ukrainian history, uh, culture, and uh, uh, pu um, public events. Uh, this is an important conference to talk about a very important historical event. You know this better than I do. And this is exactly the kind of public intellectual conversation that we should be happening when we think about ensuring that a, there's an understanding of the past and allowing us to move forward into a better future. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. I'm delighted to be uh, the dean that is responsible for the Canadian Institute for Ukrainian Studies. And I wish you a great conference where you debate hard, uh, think deeply, and come away with a new vision of the history of Ukraine in this period. Thank you. Next, I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Randall Hansen, uh, who is the interim uh, director of the Monk School presently, and uh, the director of the Center for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies to speak to you. Thanks, Frank. Sorry, I'm a bit dehydrated. And that's because I cycled in, not because I took advantage of our new found freedoms at 12.01 <laughs> last night. <laughs> Tempting, though it was. So thank you. As Frank said, I'm <clears throat> interim director of the newly merged Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy and permanent director of the Center for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies, also here at the Monk School. And I'm delighted uh, to welcome you to this conference. And I'd like to begin with a few congratulations. At the University of Toronto, to the Ukrainian Institute for, uh, sorry, at the University of Toronto, to the Petro Yatsik Program for the Study of Ukraine, to the Anne Tannenbaum Center for Jewish Studies, and to the Chair of Ukrainian Studies. At the University of Alberta, to the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies, and to the Institute for Holocaust, Genocide, and Memory Studies at the University of Amherst. Congratulations to all of you for putting together such a fine conference and many, many thanks for your support. Now, to my mind, this conference stands out for three reasons. First, it's a symbol of cooperation between these three universities 
but in a national context, in particular, a symbol of cooperation between the universities of Alberta and Toronto, and I'm very glad to see Dean Cormack here. These are this country's leading institutions for the study of Ukraine. Secondly, this event places a defining, central, and horrific event of the 20th century, the Holodomor, in the context of another 20th century horror, genocide. During his book tour uh, for Bloodlands a few years ago, Timothy Snyder said, in this city, words to the effect of, we must overcome our aversion to comparison. Actually, a little bit doubtful that we had any such of aversion at Saris, but to the extent that we did, or to the extent that there was, this conference has fully transcended it. Finally, at the risk of being somewhat parochial, it says something about the importance of Ukraine to Saris and to the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. Although we are a global affairs public policy school with two professional degrees, and we're very proud of them, we are also fundamentally a research school with strengths across both global affairs, international affairs, and area national studies. Our regional centers on Asia, Japan, the US, and in this case, Europe, and Ukraine is a fundamental part of Europe, on Europe, Russia, and Eurasia, are thriving. Ukraine is, and thanks in part to the commitment and the generosity of Ukrainian Canadians, Ukraine is quite simply at the core of what Saris does and therefore at the core of what the Monk School does. I have no doubt that this conference will contribute immensely to our work and I wish you very well indeed. And now let me hand the floor back to Frank. My co-organizers of this conference uh, are Professor Alan Confino from the University of, of Massachusetts in Amherst and Andrea Graziosi of Università de Napoli Federico Due, I hope. Uh, uh, in reality, uh, I must say, uh, I was definitely the junior partner in this organization. Uh, and I think many of you have been contacted by uh, Marta Baziuk, who in reality was uh, much more of an organizer with my two colleagues. Uh, but I'm happy to be was able to contribute what I could to this. Uh, first, uh, I would like to ask Alan uh, to discuss with you uh, part of what we planned for the conference, and then Andrea. Good morning. I'm Alan Corfino. I teach history and Jewish studies at UMass Amherst, where I'm the director of the Institute for Holocaust, Genocide, and Memory Studies. Um, in the spring of 2016, Andrea and I met uh, at the Wilson Center in Washington, and we thought of doing something together about genocide. Um, and this idea has already been originated by Andrea and Frank before, and we got together, and the result is in front of us. Our idea was to bring some of the best scholars in the field, um, not simply to um, think of what has been done, but maybe to think of what are the new directions that can be done, uh, what are the, some of the problems, the limitations of the concept, some of its applications, and uh, how can we think about it further? Um, I'm delighted that all of you agreed to come. I think we have a fantastic group of people and of papers. The Institute for Holocaust, Genocide, and Memory Studies will host a follow-up conference on global history of ethnic cleansing um, next year or the year after next. Um, the Institute deals, of course, with the Holocaust, with genocide, mass violence, ethnic cleansing, and recently also with the history of Israel-Palestine, which reflects my own current interests. Um, I agree with Frank that the real uh, hero of this conference is Marta Baziuk. Without her, nothing could have been done, and I'd like to thank her 
uh, the executive director. Executive Director of the Holodomor Research and Education Consortium. I'd like also to thank Andrea and Frank. I certainly was the minor figure in the organization. Andrea did a great job and also Frank. Um, I want also to thank Anastasia Leschichin, who I hear from Marta without her, no one of us would have been here and I believe her, so thank you. And also, <laughs> the Holodomor Research and Education Center at the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies at the University of Alberta, which is very important to bring us here all together. And of course, also to the University of Toronto that hosts us. So I think you heard enough greetings and um, we are almost ready to get started. So I wish us all good discussions and uh, disagreements. Thank you. This is going to be too long, so we'll be. So thank you, you all, for being here. Then, of course, the usual, you know, I'm very grateful to Rec, to Marta, to Anastasia, to the University of Alberta, to the University of Toronto, to everybody else. Uh, we are here not to discuss what is genocide and what is not. We are to discuss the category itself. And I think the category does raise a number of problems and does challenge us now very much. And some of the challenges and the problems emerge from the papers we received. I had the great fortune to read all of them. We have papers and so and, 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 and you say, and you th read the paper of Fournay on the use of the category by the French judicial system or the paper of Scott Strauss on the problem of applying it to the political situation in Rwanda or Anne Tim on the problem of gender in this. And I, I don't want to quote everybody, but clearly the, the category raised problems. And I think these problems that we are to discuss are already within the, the category as Lemkin thought of it, because he was, as I learned from another friend who is here, that actually was divided in between the idea of a people or a group, it was not clear, that is, there is an ambiguity, because a people is a people, a group is a group, a people actually is not clear what it is, to me at least. It, there were problems with what is a people, there are problems with what is a people, which is not a clear uh, concept, as we know from political scientists. And from here also what another paper deals with, that is the Zionist origin, that is Mazzini and Herder, and the traditional national European tradition uh, uh, of what is a people are within the category, as, as Lemkin uh, elaborated it. And of course, there were the political strictures of 1947, 48, the Soviet Union, and so on and so forth. And above all, and with this I finish, there, are, there is the incredible amount of new knowledge that we accumulated. And I personally, by now I think that, for example, genocide is a subcategory of this much larger and useful category, which is mass categorical violence based on group and categories that are politically and intellectually defined. But of course, this is my opinion. Uh, but still, I would say that what happened in the past 20 years in the field of research, think of the Africanist contribution, think of the gender historian contribution. Unfortunately, we don't uh, think also of the new direction in which people like Gerlach is expanding this or of Creed, show that the categories doesn't hold together as it is. And that I really hope that in this conference we will be able to at least put the basis for rethinking it. And also, and this is really the final observation, and I think this came out very well from Fournay and Blattman, two uh, papers. Blattman, unfortunately, both of them are not with us, though they send the papers. That is the, the dangers the category presents for historians. The dangers of juridification, the dangers of uh, going after legal uh, 
minutiae that change, as in the French case, the old perspective. So really, also the dangers of the category should be at the center of our debate. With this, I finish. I thank you again very much. And I'm very eager to listen to this. So thank you. I am calling them. Uh, yes. Uh, now, just one, uh, a few mentions on organization. Uh, we have uh, our participants who are delivering papers. We also have uh, quite a number of early, we called early career scholars, uh, but those who've been able to join us, for which we are very grateful for taking part in this discussion. Uh, we have been particularly grateful to the participants for getting the papers into us so that they were available, uh, available for their colleagues to read. Uh, with that, we are going to be very strict in our time limits. Uh, that is, we are asking each of the speakers to speak 15 minutes, uh, with a few to spare, but not too many, uh, so that we can finish uh, uh, our first session in one hour and then have a slight coffee, a short coffee break, and then have ample time for discussion uh, since you've had most of you the opportunity to read the papers before and uh, may want to pursue other issues uh, as well. Obviously, for the two papers that uh, uh, are going to be presented, I, I have made a resume of Professor Blotman's paper, and Marta Bazuk has made of Professor Fournier's paper. I hope you'll be a little bit indulgent for us because we're going to be reading their text and trying to pull it out. It's a little hard then to summarize someone else's thoughts uh, if we run one or two minutes over, but we'll try not to. And with that, I'd like to ask uh, the participants in our first panel to take up their places. Come up. I will add one more. Uh, uh, caveat, uh, you have the bios to read, and we are informed that most of you are able to do so. So therefore, uh, we would ask uh, that we not present uh, our speakers and give all of the appropriate titles and all of the many accomplishments. You can read those. Uh, makes it a little easier for the chair, and it gives us a little more time for each of our speakers to, to then deliver their papers. So I've been called upon to chair this panel as well as be the commentator in the mini session after the break. Um, and I guess my role is really limited to directing traffic because I'm not introducing anyone. Now, according to the panel, the uh, program, uh, Douglas or Doug will be speaking first and I've been given strict instructions to cut you off at the knees at um, one knee at 15 minutes and both knees at 20. Okay, so over to you. Um, is there a way to, f I put some slides up here, so do you want me to? How's this? Right. <laughs> I'm going to put that back. There we go. <laughs> How's this? All right. Thank you so much. This is um, to push start on my timer. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, the, you know, this is a the organizers just did a fantastic job, as always. Um, Marta, thank you for all of the, as the interaction with us. Um, this, my paper is on Raphael Lemkin, and I, I want to say that this, uh, this constellation of, of organizations has supported my scholarship over the years. Um, and actually, the genesis of what I'm going to talk today, today about is uh, when I was here several years ago, I, um, Professor Neymark read a draft of this book, and he said my chapter on Poland was you said it very politely. It was wonderful. It was not so good. Um, and so I went back and I, I, I looked a lot. So there's a slide here of a picture that you sent me from University of Lviv, Lemkin's grade books. Um, so if it's still bad, I'll ask you just to tell me again politely. Um, <laughs> but Lemkin is Lemkin's a really fascinating uh, figure. And there's a lot. How do I flip forward here? Um, you know, Anton and I have been talking over the years, and, and we agree on several basic matters of fact. Our interpretations are a little different. Um, but, you know, there's lots of myths around who Lemkin was, um, which get locked into scholarship. And then that plays a very, very important role in the construction of people's approaches to genocide and so forth. Um, you know, there's several that are really pretty clear. Lemkin was not a very good diplomat. He's pretty bad, actually. Um, you know, the other myth is that if Lemkin said a case was genocide, therefore it is legally genocide. This is not the case. 
Lemkin considers his life work very clearly to be a failure. He writes this in his memoirs. He's depressed. He's sad. He thinks that the concept of genocide has been totally eaten away by the great powers, and the definition that we're left with, indeed the definition today, is a function of power politics. One of the nice things about having Anton's books published at the same time as mine is when people challenge me, I can say, ah, read Anton's, <laughs> right? Um, this is really, I think this is really clear from this historical analysis. The great powers, and even the small powers, really took great pains to strip out of this concept anything that they saw as against their own interests. And the, func and the result is a concept that actually really doesn't hold in a lot of important ways. And quite frankly, is not a very good concept to use in social science. We can talk about this later. Um, and the other one which is really fun is if Lemkin, you know, this is, Lemkin also told all of these diaspora groups that your, your genocide was the first genocide in history, which is another fun little legacy is every, all these different people claim Lemkin as the originator. Um, Lemkin was a really fascinating creature. He's a character. Um, the right slide up there. You know, one of the other parts of Lemkin that's really misunderstood is this notion of culture which is what uh, Andrea alluded to in the beginning. What, 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 is what, what is the thing that's being destroyed in Lemkin's thought? Is it a group? Is it a culture? Um, Lemkin did not think that the destruction of a culture was genocide. In fact, in many cases, he thought that this is progress. Um, colonialism left human beings unable to adapt with modernity, and he was quite honest about maybe it's a good thing if indigenous cultures change. Um, and one of the nuances of Lemkin's work is that actually the destruction of culture, I mean, he says this explicitly in his, in his unpublished social scientific writings. The destruction of culture is only genocide when it menaces the survival of the group, right? Now, the question then is what's the group? And the same thing for mass murder. Mass murder was not genocide for Lem, you know, in Lemkin's mind. So the question then is what, you know, what is this notion of a group? Well, you'll see the UN definition um, really privileges these groups, and there's a historical reason for that, which I, th I think Anton will uh, allude to. Um, but the, and the, but the really the important part of the UN definition is these bold words here, bodily harm, physical destruction, um, you know, preventing births, forcible transfer of children. These are really physical uh, concepts, right? So there's the UN definition really privileges the physical destruction or physical attacks upon a group. Compare this to Lemkin's definition in Access Rule. Now I've taken about a paragraph and I've condensed it here. So I just refer you to Access Rule. Uh, genocide is a destruction of ethnicities or nations, a colonial process. You can imagine what the UK and the thought about when they read colonial process. Um, you know, in two phases. First phase, the destruction of the national patterns of the oppressed. The second, the national patterns of the oppressor. And what's interesting in Lemkin's work is this conception that genocide is the destruction of a pattern, a national pattern, is the thing that holds throughout his career. Um, really from the beginnings of his work in the late 1920s when he's talking about Soviet penal code and depression of the Soviet Union. Um, he's talking about the, the penal codes of Soviet law has criminalized enemy forms of consciousness, enemy nations. Um, and this holds all the way through his lectures at Yale University at the end of his career. Um, now, of course, what is a national pattern? Uh, Lemkin doesn't really say, right? He thinks that they're mental constructions, first and foremost. Um, he, has, he has some allusions to, he writes Carl Renner, Carl Renner letter at the end of his life, says, I've de devoted my whole life to outlawing your principle of national cultural autonomy, but internationalizing it. So there's, and, and I have some professors, some of Lemkin's professors were not national autonomy advocates. So I personally think that this is this definition that it holds with Lemkin, but as Professor Moses points out, where's the proof? I don't know, I don't have any proof. Um, Lemkin didn't cite anybody. It's part, of, part of the fun thing about studying Lemkin is that you find all the times he lies to people, and then all the times he like passes off ideas as his own. It's really fun. Um, but he, he doesn't cite, and so we're sort of left holding the bag. Of, um, but let's, um, you know, there's, there's one thing that I want to really emphasize here is that whatever Lemkin's conception of the group was, these are the jurists and delegates at the UN who really opposed Lemkin's ideas. They found it fraught. I mean, this is um, a motto from Brazil has a letter to Lemkin where he says, if you outlaw genocide, you'll be committing genocide against Latin America because it's in our culture to commit genocide against political opponents. Um, it's really a fun letter, right? Um, and of course, you have Vyshinsky, who in 1933 
34, denounced Lemkin as an enemy of the revolution. Um, and then Shawcross. Shawcross was quite hostile to this concept of genocide. Um, and I talked about this in the book and so forth. Um, Lemkin's strongest supporters at the UN were from countries that were former colonies. Um, Pakistan and India were really were, were key movers. Another, another delegation that was extremely important was the Egyptian delegation. Um, that, the, Egypt, the Egyptian delegate was Lemkin's person on the inside. That was Lemkin's guy on the inside of the, of the conversations of what's happening around genocide. And it's clear here from these people that the colonial aspect of this concept was central for them. And they grabbed hold of the notion of a destruction of a national pattern, of course, without ever really defining them. Uh, I'll skip through these slides. This is uh, part of the fun of looking at Lemkin. He's practicing his Chinese, right? <laughs> you can, I wish I could practice my Chinese. Um, I'm going to just skip through. Let's see. Let me go here. I made too many slides. OK. Um, so Lemkin's ideas, I think, if we're to really to come to the theme of this conference about you know, what is the history of this concept as a category, um, you know, I'll go back one slide here. These are, these are parts of Lemkin's tradition which are, in a lot of ways, equally important to the shaping his notion of genocide. Soviet terror was crucial in the 20s and in the early 1930s. There's a reason why Vyshinsky denounces him as an enemy of the revolution. It's not just random. The concept of the colonial violence was crucial. The nationalities violence, obviously. Austro-Hungarian Marxism, Jewish philosophy, historiography, the laws of armed conflict, and then what Mark Lewis has called the new justice. These are all portions that Lemkin's drawing on. And Lemkin never explains the contradictions between these schools. He just embraces them and moves forward. Um, it's part of what makes him a funny character. Um, his ideas really, however, take a fascinating turn at this university. Uh, and this is the page that Professor Neymark emailed to me from Lemkin's grades book. Um, so I went back to Lviv and I began asking questions about who was this professor that Lemkin took this class with. And you find people and those people lead to people. And sure enough, you find you know, old books come out of the closets and so forth. Um, and what, what emerges then is actually an intellectual life where I don't think Lemkin is so much creating concepts as synthesizing concepts. Um, he's not, it's not like the concept of genocide floats from outer space and he, you know, he has divine inspiration and poof, here's this concept that he invented. Um, in a lot of ways, he's kind of gently, politely ripping off his professors. Sometimes he cites them, sometimes he doesn't. Um, but you see aspects of his concept of genocide um, emerge within their thought. Um, and it's no accident, Felipe Sanz's really beautiful book, East West Street, um, says it's no accident that Hirsch Lauterpat, who developed crimes against humanity, went to the same law school as Lemkin. Um, there's something there. They took the same courses with the same professors. Um, Lemkin called genocide a crime against humanity. He thought that what genocide was going to do is preserve the ability for individuals to enjoy whatever kind of national affiliations they wanted. Um, his definition of a nation was so broad, in his own words, it could include those who play at cards. Think about this. His definition of a nation is a social group that shares a consciousness, right? A self-forming consciousness. So therefore, national identity, as Professor Moses put in the chapter on Lemkin, it's, for Lemkin, it's not a zero-sum game. One identity doesn't counteract the other. You can be members of many nations at once. This is possible. And this, in fact, is part of what he says drives the creativity of humanity, the progress of humanity. It was the ability for people to be whatever, to join whatever national groups they wanted. Small, big, he wanted to preserve that ability. Well, this idea takes hold right, within a collection of thinkers and lawyers and professors who are circling around this university. Now, in the 1940s and 50s, uh, Lemkin makes a turn. He starts reading uh, Franz Neumann, Sigmund Neumann, Ernest Frankel. In fact, the dual state, if you look at the table of contents of the dual state, it's almost identical to the table of contents of Axis rule in occupied Europe, except Frankel says he will, he's going to ignore Nazi law. And of course, what does Lemkin do? He spends most of the book documenting the Lem Nazi law. Um, but that's, that's in the 40s and 50s when his ideas changes. Um, the 1920s and 30s, this is the collection of people who uh, he wrote about and wrote about him um, or he made some clear allusions to. So let's go into 
some of his professors. Um, Ludwig Ehrlich wrote a really, really fascinating book called The Law of Nations. Um, and, Lud and Ehrlich had a very distinguished career as an international jurist. Uh, he was already a, a distinguished jurist when he was Lamkin's professor. Um, but one of the things that he was lecturing on at this time was that the laws of humanity were or had to be, all of the laws of humanity were orientated towards peace and a mutual respect for difference of all individuals. Thus, international law did not need a philosophical or legal grounding, which of course, if you, uh, if you read, you know, like this was a Kelsen was in search of a philosophical grounding for the law. I mean, this was what, what is the law? Um, this, is a, this is a notion of the law that Lemkin actually starts to take hold of, right? That the law itself is what brings groups into existence. Now, there's aspects of Jewish law embedded in this. The law is what constitutes the people, right? The covenant. The people is born through the law. The law is a, is, is a, is a moral, ethical, social force. And out of the law comes the social group. This is, now, this is Lemkin's reading. This is not really, this, this is, anyway, I'll let that, you ask me questions later. Um, but for Lemkin, international law is something that expresses these principles of harmony, acceptance of all people, but at the same time, it's through the law that the group is born. And the group comes into existence as a group, as such. And the law for him is a covenant. So he transposes this and he begins to think of international law in the same way. It's very telling that he doesn't say a single word about due process, about evidence, about the rights of the accused. He doesn't really care if there are actually tribunals that function. He thinks the genocide convention itself, through the moral force of the law, without any prosecutions or trials or courtrooms attached to it, itself is a moral statement that can bring into existence certain values that can change the world. While I have problems with this, I do want to point out that I don't think you'd have an ambassador that would say anymore, it's in our culture to commit genocide, right? So there is a little bit of a shift in norms that there's a little bit of a point there. Um, let's see. Yeah, this is my slide about the accused. Julius Markowitz is a fascinating character. This is Lemkin's famous paper on the, uh, on the Armenian genocide. He says he wrote this paper um, in response to this professor's lectures. Um, and one of the things that, that Lemkin, this, this professor was a sparring partner for Lemkin. Um, and actually, they became good friends. Um, Markowitz wrote a, a couple forewords to some of Lemkin's works and opened a path for him to, to, to have a career in the government in Poland. Um, but Markowitz himself had, in the things that he was writing and teaching at the time, were that national minorities on borders were politically dangerous. And they had to be converted to have new national identities. This was his big thing. That what, you had nations, and then the people on the borders of the state that had a different national identity, they had to be converted into that new identity. This was his big thing. Um, and this is an interesting notion here of national identity that, that Lemkin actually embraces. I mean, if you can commit genocide and destroy a nation, but leave every human being alive, then obviously the nation is different than the body and the individual. So somehow there's a process of you can lose a nation but remain alive. You can have that identity change. Well, you see elements of this with the argument that maybe we should be changing the national identity of people who live on borders. Um, it's a, and, and Markowitz himself is a very right-wing character. He, he, and it, he's a fascinating career with, you can ask me more questions. I think I'm almost done. I got, I'm about ready to chop off one of my knees. Um, getting close. Like the, like the Saudi embassy. Like the Saudi, yeah. <laughs> Don't get me started on that. That's a, that, that's a real threat. That's a, so this last sort of, I'll sort of come to, I mean, there's a whole sort of tradition of, of, of professors that are talking in totalitarianism. Um, but one of the really important sort of aspects here is Rappaport, Pella, and Febreze. And these are the three that most people know. Um, one of the things that really was telling for me is that Lemkin's concept of barbarity and vandalism, which genocide scholars debate whether or not barbarity and vandalism is the beginning of the concept of genocide. Lemkin is actually citing his professors when he uses the words barbarity and vandalism. Um, in, the, in the French draft of this article, he cites, he says that they're, they're, they're Pella's words, right? They're Pella's concepts. And he's going to give them some depth that Pella never gave it. Uh, what is the destruction, the physical destruction of a group versus the non-physical destruction of a group? Of course, barbarity is acts of violence and vandalism acts of cultural destruction. 
So we see here this process, and of course, and then you know, these three jurists had careers of their own. I mean, the, they went on and they took these ideas and they fought with Lemkin at the UN, right? I mean, there, was, there, were, there were Polish national tribunals that prosecuted genocide um, very early on. There's, there's a whole sort of history of this concept that, that it lives on in, in their work beyond Lemkin. Um, and, and Vibris very clearly thought at the UN that, that Lemkin's idea didn't belong to Lemkin. They sparred over this. Um, and this is, you know, Pella had written a book that one of the things international law should be doing is should be worrying about fanatical nationalists and religious groups who are capable of seizing control of state institutions and then would use the organs of the state to repress or force people to adopt cultural practices of the group in power or face repression. Well, that, doesn't, that sounds a lot like Lemkin's notions of genocide. Um, and De Vries, had written a, De Vries had written a book on the stranger in international law um, and the, the need to respect strangers. So we go back to this concept of genocide here, and all of a sudden you begin to see that this notion had a history to it. Um, this notion that the genocide was the destruction of national patterns of the oppressed. Um, and, then what the, and then this one really, you know, this, this is the larger point that I think is, is great for this conference, is that this idea totally changes. It gets completely rewritten. Um, it's, uh, these slides probably don't make any sense now, but um, you know, I've cut a lot, but the idea changes. It's not Lemkin's idea anymore. There's a political process that shapes it. There's moral processes. Groups hold on to the concept. They take different things. Um, and Lemkin himself, the final part, is that, let's see, I lost track of the slides. Um, Lemkin's concept changes himself. When he wants to, he, he subtracts from the concept in order to exclude African Americans. He adds to the concept to include other groups. He himself, his concept changes through history. So I hope this has succeeded in starting us off. Um, that's really all that I wanted to talk about. Thank you. <clears throat> Very good morning, everyone. Uh, Shortly after the General Assembly had adopted the Genocide Convention, the New York uh, Home News Magazine summarized the process leading up to it as follows. The US was indifferent, the Soviets said no, and the British never. Uh, I've done extensive research in American, British, and Soviet archives, or former Soviet archives, and I can confirm as to the accuracy of this perception uh, none of the great powers actually sought or even wanted a genocide treaty. Uh, genocide convention, as argued uh, elsewhere, is basically, has proved a casualty of the Cold War. Uh, the great powers thought of a prospective genocide convention not as a way forward to the international law, but as a sort of liability. Uh, the issue at stake was how to prevent the adversary from applying the Genocide Convention to own wrongdoings. And so consequently, I argue that Genocide Convention had a much stronger sort of political imp uh, underpinning and also implication than most other comparative documents on international law. I deliberate, uh, deliberately leave uh, Lemkin out of this picture. Well, first we have Doug on the panel. And the second reason that Lemkin was simply sidelined from the drafting process past the uh, summer 1947 uh, so-called secretariat draft. Uh, just to give a broader perspective on the uh, United States uh, uh, signed the convention in 1948, but didn't, did not ratify it until 1988. Uh, United Kingdom uh, didn't sign and finally adhered to Genocide Convention in 1970 and the Soviet Union signed in uh, 1949, ratified with two reservations in 1954, and finally withdrew the reservations during the Gorbachev's perestroika in 1989. Uh, what I'm presenting today is sort of a result of a decade-long uh, project, which resulted in these four books, and I can help to engage in a bit of self-promotion <laughs> if you're interested. If uh, any of your questions won't be answered, you get the answer quite here. Uh, in my research, I focused really on the Soviet perspective on the Genocide Convention, so I may as well start, uh, start off with, with that. Uh, some of you uh, may know uh, Lemkin, in October 1946, approached 16 different delegations in the UN with a request to put genocide on agenda, uh, of the UN agenda. Uh, none of them were interested, and still 
uh, this proposal was voted unanimously in, uh, also by the Soviets. At this point, the Soviet policy was to yield on minor issues such as genocide convention to avoid making the impression that the Soviets are opposed to all things United Nations. Uh, Soviet Foreign Minister Vyacheslav Molotov inquired uh, if there is any Soviet law relevant to prosecution of genocide, uh, the answer that he got from uh, well, employees of the foreign ministry was rather unexpected, Article 58 of the Russian Penal Code. Ironically, uh, for those of you who are not familiar, Article 58, so-called counter-revolutionary crimes, was a staple of the Soviet political repression in the 1930s and, and later on. Well, the process of negotiations around the Genocide Convention evolved in parallel with the Cold War, which, well, one of the most crucial events uh, was, of course, unveiling of the Marshall Plan and eventual rejection by Stalin. So that was in the summer of 1947. Uh, around the same time, the American diplomat commented that the Soviets are digging the hills on the Genocide Convention. Uh, they want to stall the entire process by uh, suggesting an article-by-article -article consideration. So now we have this uh, first comprehensive uh, draft of the Genocide Convention, so-called Secretariat Draft of June 1947, which faithfully carried out uh, Lemkin's original thinking of genocide, uh, not least because Lemkin participated, uh, along with other two scholars, in drafting uh, the, the first uh, document. So this draft offered the, the widest possible formula, which was supposed to serve as a sort of basis for further discussion. And an expectation was indeed that this draft would be sort of narrowed down. Let's take one of the central elements of a draft convention, Article 1, which uh, dealt with uh, physical destruction. Among other criminal acts, it spoke of confiscation of property and, uh, I quote, excessive work of physical exertion likely to result in a debilitation or death of the individuals. Well, that's exactly what was happening to the millions of victims who wound up in Stalin's gulag. As you can imagine, the Soviets were not at all pleased with the Secretariat draft. Uh, they were pleased neither with the contents nor with the fact that they couldn't exercise any direct control over negotiations, unlike in the Security Council, where they, of course, had the veto power. Uh, to remind you, the drafting of a genocide convention took place in a pluralistic setting, uh, with which format Soviets were simply uh, not familiar. In November 1947, the Soviets filed consecutively several resolutions First, they proposed to delay the discussion of the draft convention until some time later. Uh, then they insisted that codifying the so-called Nuremberg principles was a much better a way forward. And finally, they argued that actually there was no need for the convention altogether. A few days later, so it's November 1947, a political bomb went off. Ukrainian and Baltic emigre organization in the United States appealed to UN to investigate what they called Soviet genocide. Uh, most ominous for the Soviets was an inference that by hunting down and killing members of arms, uh, armed insurgency, which was ongoing in the Western Soviet borderlands, uh, the USSR was committing genocide. And I mean, again, imagine how would you react if you belonged, to, if you were part of a Soviet leadership? Sure, you'd like to ensure that so the genocide convention could not be potentially used against the Soviet Union, and ideally put the Americans and the British on the defensive by the means of the convention. Uh, to Moscow's uh, chagrin, the UN decided, nevertheless, to go ahead with the genocide convention. And so as of early 1948, we're seeing sort of the emergency, uh, emergence of a Soviet discourse on genocide, which can be summarized in just a few sentences. Uh, a, the only true genocide was perpetrated by Nazi Germany. B, elements of the crime are currently present in several countries which spectacularly fail to ban fascist organizations. And uh, C, fascism emerges as a key word that links Nazi crimes to more modern forms of genocide. On top of that, the Soviets advanced sort of argument at hominem, uh, and that was real in the proceedings, said, well, unlike you, the West, we know all about the genocide because we experienced firsthand. So the, first, uh, the Soviets were effectively taking sort of uh, uh, high moral ground in these discussions. Uh, in late March and early April 1948, the Soviets worked out an alternative text of the draft genocide convention, which was personally edited by Foreign Molotov in blue pencil and subsequently by Stalin in red pencil, but I also know they work with different color pencils on other occasions. 
And those few documents really kind of constitute the core of a Soviet conception of genocide. Uh, the original guidelines of the Soviet representative on the UN ad hoc committee on genocide spoke of organic link between genocide and fascism and related ideologies, uh, added Molotov, and rejected the principle of universal jurisdiction, so important to Lemkin. Uh, that is to say, no to an idea of International Criminal Court, ICC, and according to the Soviets, uh, all cases should be tried in domestic courts. Molotov was explicit. There is no way the Soviet Union would agree on confiscation of property and effectively forced labor to become elements of the crime of genocide. Uh, generally, had the Soviet proposal bill rejected, the delegation should vote against the Genocide Convention as a whole. Uh, and now comes Stalin, who got to read the document previously, you know, edited by Molotov. So what does Stalin want or doesn't want to see in the Genocide Convention? Well, uh, he augments the link between fascism, Nazism, and related ideologies with, I quote, analogous racist theories that preach racial and ethnic hatred. He crossed out all the reference to international law. The Soviets were averted to all things international, preferring them to the bilateral relations. Like Molotov, Stalin is found of the concept cultural genocide, so cultural and or put religious in the parenthesis. And most crucially, he crosses out the word political as a motivation to commit genocide throughout the document. That is to say, no protection is extended to political groups. So basically afterwards, the Soviets stuck to the basic provisions on the Genocide Convention throughout the course of negotiations. Uh, simultaneously, the Soviet tactics had changed from the defensive to more offensive. They now explicitly referred to lynching in the United States and British colonial policy, uh, policies as examples of genocide, uh, while arguing that the inclusion of political groups was, I quote, not in conformity with the scientific definition of genocide, despite the fact that the word genocide didn't even exist until 1944. Late in the drafting process, the Soviet delegation was instructed against making a fuss about political groups, and thus for the Soviets, the ICC remained the only issue that the delegation was supposed to vote down. At the end of the day, even if the Soviet amendment had been rejected, Molotov told uh, the delegation at Paris to support the Genocide Convention as a whole. Okay, let's now turn to the Americans of the perspective on Genocide Convention. Signs of war started appearing within the US State Department in the summer of 1947. The Americans too believed that secretariat draft was unnecessary broad Say, it could encompass the work of the House Committee on American Activities or the work of American missionaries abroad. Americans were also opposed to the draft provision concerning forced transfer of minorities. Well, you see, I mean, the U.S. unwittingly signed up to the 1945 Yalta and Potsdam agreements that led up to expulsion of 13 million ethnic Germans from uh, Eastern and Central Europe. Uh, speaking confidentially in September 1947, a State Department official, well, Charles Fire prophetically stated, I quote, he didn't anticipate the convention actually being invoked for 50 years, or maybe 20. Uh, here I am thinking 1947 plus 50, that is 1997, and the first convention, uh, uh, conviction for genocide, the Akayashu case, came in 1998. But uh, sure enough, I was no Nostradamus, it was just coincidence, of course. So consequently, the first official U.S. communication on the matter of genocide argued against the inclu uh, inclusion of forced exile and linguistic groups, yet supported the inclusion of political groups and universal jurisdiction. The final decision on the ICC lay outside of the purview of the Genocide Convention, argued the Americans. Around the same time, September 1947, the State Department mentioned for the first time an emerging issue of concern to the U.S. government racial discrimination against uh, black Americans. Though I should uh, say that at this point in time, it was concluded that it would be rather unlikely to be considered under the heading of genocide. Uh, nevertheless, uh, as the time uh, uh, went on, hate crimes became a liability for the United States, whether the discussion centered on prospective penal code or state complicity, American diplomats watched out that no elements of a genocide convention could be construed, I quote, in such a way as to cause us difficulties with cases such as lynching. Going into the deliberation of an ad hoc uh, committee on genocide in 1948, many in American concern began to mirror Soviet 
In essence, the final text of the convention should contain no provisions applicable to past and present abuses committed by the drafting nations. Uh, perhaps the most uh, striking uh, was U.S. backtracking an idea of international penal code. In the opposite case, as argument when communist bloc could hypothetically establish an international tribunal to try for genocide American citizens in their custody. Uh, the confidential State Department report from June 1948 testified to the draft convention becoming a pawn in ideological struggle between the two superpowers. It directly accuses Soviets of fashioning the Genocide Convention into a propaganda weapon, as opposed to American efforts, of course, to draft a sort of comprehensive legal document. Uh, the Americans, so the future State Secretary John Foster Dulles, to be precise, briefly toyed with the idea of including economic and social groups in the convention. That idea, however, was uh, instantly dropped along the pre uh, previous instance on including, uh, inclusion of political groups. As of fall 1948, uh, the former allies, terribly dicto, found themselves in agreement that the crimes committed by Nazi Germany did constitute quintessential genocide. The incessant Soviet assault drew home the realization that the genocide treaty, once adopted, might be turned either way. Uh, at this point, it also became obvious that neither the communist uh, or Western bloc wanted to establish an ICC. And now briefly, onward to the uh, British. Yeah, sure, three minutes, we have time. Uh, the British from outset remained skeptical as to the vitality and necessity of the Genocide Convention. Uh, Sir uh, uh, Hartley Shawcross, whose picture was on the screen, argued, some would say pragmatically, others cynically in September 1937, that the convention would not date uh, debtor, uh, debtor state from committing genocide. Instead, he suggested relying on existing law as had been formulated and executed at Nuremberg. Only reluctantly, the British adopted a more consolatory line, conscious of the embarrassing indifference to the crime of genocide that the posture in the United Nations had projected. Unlike the Americans, the British stood firm on the issue of political groups, and in that particular reason became a target of Lemkin uh, criticism. If national, racial, and religious groups were to be protected, argued Shawcross, why not political? Uh, the issue of colonialism, which was again mentioned, was uh, when linked to genocide made the British feel particularly vulnerable. Preemptively, the UK delegations reasoned against extending the treaty's provision to non-self-governing territories, that is, former colonies, as unconstitutional. Beside colonial policies, British diplomats confidentially came up with a number of instances that they thought may potentially be labeled genocide. Uh, it's a pretty long list. The treatment of Jews in Palestine, the expulsion of ethnic Germans from Eastern Europe, the expulsion of communists from Greece, the treatment of ethnic Germans in the British zone of occupation, firebombing of German cities, and atomic bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. When debating the Soviet amendment of public propaganda of genocide, the British diplomat declared that he would not have had any problems with it had the world situation been different. He feared that the Soviet Union would use this provision to, I quote, aims other than the campaign against genocide. Despite deep, deep misgivings about the Genocide Convention, uh, the British uh, had managed, and uh, the Shawcross in particular, to convince the Home Office in London that the United Kingdom should vote yes on the, genos uh, on the Genocide Convention. Even then, it was more of a sort of face-saving measure not to end up in a company with the Soviets who were expected to vote against the Convention. And so on December 9th, 1948, as you know, the Genocide Convention was passed unanimously. Chairman of the Drafting Commission, uh, Committee, the American John Mactus, congratulated its members on the passing of the Genocide Treaty without mentioning that, I quote, they had put across our position in relation to genocide so successfully. The New York Herald Tribune hailed the signing of a genocide convention, described it as an idealistic document. Uh, I guess not much to say by way of uh, conclusion. Uh, I believe I made my point pretty clear, both in my paper, uh, Britain and Oro today. Uh, when Lemkin originally uh, conceived of a genocide convention, he thought that, again, the quotation, such a treaty would take the life of nation out of the hand of politicians and give it the objective basis of law. And uh, my paper suggests the exact opposite outcome, namely the primacy of politics over humanitarian or legal consideration in the, uh, in the UN Genocide Convention. Thank you.
So I'll be reading Carolyn Fournay's paper. Unfortunately, she was unable to be with us today. The French legal position with respect to international crimes is particularly striking in its divergence between progressive law and a disciplined practice. This paper focuses both on the French domestic definition of genocide and crimes against humanity, as well as on the relevant national case law, thus highlighting the dichotomy between theory and practice and tentatively suggesting explanations for it. The first part of the paper deals with the definition of the crime of genocide as embodied in Article 211.1 of the French Penal Code. This theoretical analysis notably focuses on the fact that Although the French definition draws upon the definition enshrined in the United Nations Convention, it also significantly departs from it in two important aspects. Paradoxically, the French practice has failed to adequately follow the theory, and the crime of genocide has often remained inexplicably absent from the courtroom, where the notion of crimes against humanity seems to have been favored. It is only very recently that genocide as a legal def qualification was used by the French courts, and only in a few cases related to the Rwandan genocide. The second part of the paper thus explores the practical manifestations of this judicial reluctance toward the crime of genocide and argues that such attitudes have no legal or factual justification. The third and fourth part demonstrate that French courts have generally proved equally hesitant to try crimes against humanity, even after the entry into force of the progressive new penal code in 1994. France signed the Genocide Convention on, 11th, on the December 11, 1948, only two days after its adoption by the General Assembly, Assembly of the United Nations. France subsequently ratified the Genocide Convention in 1950, thus showing its, its commitment to the prevention and punishment of the crime of genocide rather early on. As noted by Karen Smith, one issue that somewhat curiously did not really arise during the negotiations or ratification process is concern that European colonial powers could be accused of genocide themselves. Several countries still had col colonies after the Second World War, including Belgium, France, the Netherlands, Portugal, and the UK. Those countries might thus have reason not to accede or ratify the convention, not because they were intent on committing genocide, but because they feared being accused of having committed genocide in those colonies. Yet two colonial powers, Belgium and France, ratified the convention almost immediately. The Netherlands, Portugal, and the UK did not. The convention entered into force in January 1951. Nonetheless, the crime of genocide only made its formal entrance in French legislation in March 1994 with the entry into force of the new penal code, which defines genocide uh, as follows. According to the new penal code, genocide occurs when in the enforcement of a concerted plan aimed at the partial or total destruction of a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group, or a group determined by any other arbitrary criterion, one of the following actions are committed or caused to be committed against members of the group. Willful attack on life, serious attack on psychic or physical integrity, subjection to living conditions likely to entail the partial or total destruction of the group, measures aimed at preventing births, enforced child transfers. While the conventional definition defines the crime of genocide by the intent to destroy a group, the French definition put the emphasis on the planned and systematic feature of the crime, the existence of a concerted plan. Also, the scope of application of the definition of genocide is significantly enlarged. And indeed, although the Genocide Convention only affords protection to national, ethnic, racial, or religious groups as such, the French disposition grants protection to all of these conventionally protected groups as well as to groups, quote, determined by any other arbitrary criterion. The Genocide Convention has been heavily criticized for its narrow sphere of application, and it thus seems that France, by recognizing that genocide could be committed against other groups than the ones expressly listed in the convention, adopted a more progressive approach. In this context, it is therefore intriguing that the concept of genocide has remained largely absent from prosecutions, and the question arises as to whether legal obstacles could have impeded its application in prosecutions. <laughs> 
And, and now the paper talks about the direct applicability of the Genocide Convention under French law. Even if genocide only entered the French Penal Code in 1994, France had ratified the convention in 1950, and the convention should have been of immediate application as soon as it had entered into force in 1951. And indeed, France is a country of monist tradition where treaties once ratified had the force superior to that of national laws. Thus, at the time of the ratification of the Genocide Convention, this principle was unequivocally stated in Article 26 of the 1946 Constitution. In other words, the Genocide Convention was directly applicable under French law, and in fact, uh, in his commentary on the Genocide Convention, Robinson expressly cited France as one of the states where, quote, an international agreement becomes domestic law by ratification. The second potential obstacle to the qualification of crime as genocide under French law before the new penal code became into effect must be acknowledged here, um, as both the international law and French law are rather confusing. The Genocide Convention is totally silent on this particular matter. The first international instrument which explicit, explicitly prohibited the application of statutory limitations to the crime of genocide is the 1968 UN Convention on Non-Applicability of Statutory Limitations to War Crimes and Crimes Against Humanity. Although this convention has failed to attract a wide amount of ratification, including by France, by the way, it is still submitted here that as of today, statutory limitations do not apply to the crime of genocide. And indeed, Article 29 of state Statute of the International Criminal Court unequivocally affirms that, quote, the crimes within the jurisdiction of the court shall not be subject to any statute of limitations. The French position on this matter is not clear due to confusion between crimes against humanity and genocide. Nonetheless, under French law, statutory limitations have not been an obstacle to the application of the Genocide Convention. First, although France did not ratify the 68 Convention, it must be noted here that the Foreign Affairs Ministry interpreted the silence of the Genocide Convention as a confirmation that the crime of genocide was not subjected to statutory limitations. Second, under French law, the non-applicability of statutory limitations to crimes against humanity is clear and unequivocal. Faced with the urgency emanating from the fact that crimes committed during the Second World War would soon be subjected to statutory limitations, the French legislature unanimously adopted a law recognizing the non-applicability of statutory limitations to crimes against humanity, and crimes against humanity only. The question thus arises as to whether crimes against humanity were here understood as encompassing the crime of genocide. It appears that the French legislature intended to include the crimes, crimes of genocide within the notion of crimes against humanity. Third, France is not a party to the UN 1968 Convention. The reason for not ratifying it was the non-applicability of statutory limitations to war crimes, which under French law have traditionally been subjected to statutory limitations. Had the UN 68 Convention only dealt with crimes against humanity and genocide, France would have had no reason not to ratify it. All of these elements overwhelmingly show that since 1964, France recognizes the non-applicability of statutory limitations to genocide. A third possible obstacle which could impede the application of the Genocide Convention to acts committed prior to the entry into force of the new penal code in France is the issue of retroactivity. If under the international law, the principle is that treaties have no retroactive force, this rule nonetheless fails to be absolute, notably in the case of genocide, even if the Genocide Convention re remains silent on the matter. Article 15 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which deals with the prohibition of retroactive criminal laws, expressly makes an exception to the general principle in the following terms. It says, no one shall be held guilty of any criminal offense on account of any act or omission which did not cons constitute a criminal offense under national or international law at the time when it was committed, nor shall ha a heavier penalty be imposed than the one that was applicable at the time when the criminal offense was committed. If subsequent to the commission of the offense, provision is made by law for the imposition of a lighter penalty, the offender shall benefit thereby. Nothing in this article shall prejudice the trial and punishment of any person for any act 
or a mission which at the time when it was committed was criminal according to the general principles of law recognized by the community of nations. So it seems clear that the general principles of law recognized by the community of nations do encompass the prohibition of genocide, although it could be argued that this prohibition stems from international rules of international customary law and is therefore covered by the reference to international law. Um, how are we doing on time? Oh. Okay, in, and in fact, this reference to international law is attributable to proposals by Uruguay and France who argued that it would prevent persons responsible for the commission of international crimes to evade punishment if they would simply plead that their offenses were not punishable under domestic law at the time they were committed. In other words, France expressly showed its attachment to the punishment of international crimes and in this respect adopted a proactive approach in keeping with obligations under international law. In such circumstances, it would be doubtful that France would see any legal obstacle in the application uh, of Article 15 in res in, with respect to genocide convention. As a matter of fact, this would be even more doubtful considering the fact that Article 7 of the European Convention on Human Rights, to which France is a party, reiterated the content in nearly the exact same terms. And now the paper discusses the French courts and the Shoah, the qualification of crimes against humanity and the equalization of crimes and victims. The memory of the genocide perpetrated during the Second World War took a very long time to emerge in France, and the first trial to deal effectively with this genocide was that of Klaus Barbie. For the first time, the Shoah was at the heart of legal debates. The trial of Barbie was subsequently followed by those of Paul Touvier, active member of the French police, Maurice Papin, a former high civil servant, and Alois Brunet. Most surprisingly, all those who stood accused for their participation in the Shoah were not charged with genocide, but with crimes against humanity. If, in theory, one could argue that crimes against humanity and genocide do cover the same reality, genocide being an aggravated form of crimes against humanity, the consequences of this amalgam in practice were far more important, not only regarding the law, but also regarding collective memory of the Shoah. The following development thus analyzes the practice of French courts regarding genocide and their reluctance to apply the Genocide Convention, in spite of the fact that, as previously demonstrated, the convention was applicable in France. The trial of Barbie was symptomatic of the reluctance of French courts to apply the Genocide Convention. Barbie, chief of the Gestapo in Lyon, also known as the Butcher of Lyon, owed this reputation to his relentless struggle against resistance fighters but he was also responsible for the deportation of Jews and thus for his active participation in the Shoah. He was nonetheless charged only with crimes against humanity and not with genocide. As the Court of Appeals of Lyon acknowledged, the clear differences between crimes committed against resistant fighters and crimes committed against Jews, it established two distinct qualifications for these two types of crimes. Yet this is precisely where the problem started because the Court of Appeals qualified crimes against resistant fighters as war crimes and crimes against Jews as crimes against humanity. In practice, this meant that due to the application of statutory limitations under French law to war crimes, Barbie could only be tried for what the court qualified as crimes against humanity, namely the crimes perpetra perpetrated against Jews. In other words, crimes perpetrated against resistance fighters were considered war crimes and would go unpunished. This partial impunity, which would be awarded to Barbie, was both illegitimate and unacceptable. And in fact, the limits of the distinction created by the courts of appeals rapidly emerged when the court had to solve the question of the qualification of the crimes perpetrated against Jewish resistance fighters. So now someone is both a Jew and a resistance fighter. The question which arose with respect to one of Barbie's victims, Professor Gompel. In this particular case, the court explained Barbie could have thought that he was a resistance fighter and therefore the presumption of innocence must apply here, that, that Gompel could have been. We must consider by presumption that he was a non-innocent Jew and that the tortures Gompel had to endure fell within the statutory limitations applicable to war crimes. In other words, pushing its distinction to the extremes, the court, in order to exclude all resistance fighters from the scope of application of crimes against humanity, defined Jews, who were also members of the resistance, as non-innocent Jews, a very unfortunate choice of terminology, to say the least. 
In the eyes of the court, it could not ascertain that Barbie knew that they were Jews. The quality of the victims as resistance fighters was found to prevail, and the crimes perpetrated against them were thus crimes subjected to statutory limitations under French law. But in December 85, the Cour de Cassation quashed this decision of the appeals court and found that Uh, legally speaking, crimes against humanity were defined no longer by the nature and the quality of the victim, but by the nature of the acts and the ideological identity of the, of the perpetrator. This decision has to be welcomed as the recognition of the commission of crimes against humanity against resistance fighters, and as the application of crimes against humanity as defined in the Nuremberg Charter. Where it is far more problematic is in the confusion it creates by giving the same qualification to the different crimes perpetrated by the Nazis. The problem with the different decisions in the Barbie case lies in the starting point. And indeed, if the Court of Appeals was correct in distinguishing be between crimes perpetrated against resistance fighters and crimes perpetrated against Jews, it nonetheless erred in the qualification of these crimes. Subsequently, in order not to let some crimes go unpunished, the Cour de Cassation included crimes perpetrated against resistance fighters within the ambit of crimes against humanity. Far from it, this was not an artificial extension of the notion. It was merely applying Article 6 of the Charter of, Nurem, of the Nuremberg Trial. In other words, right from the beginning of the legal proceedings, crimes against resistance fighters should have been qualified as crimes against humanity by direct application of the Nuremberg Charter. On the other hand, French courts should have distinguished between the crimes committed against resistance fighters, which were crimes against humanity, and crimes perpetrated against Jews, which should have been recognized as genocide. By qualifying all Nazi crimes as crimes against humanity, the Cour de Cassation equalized the crimes of the victims and thus failed to acknowledge crucial differences between them. It is indeed a different crime to target political opponents who have chosen to become opponents and to target whole families, men, women, children, for the only reason that they were, in the eyes of the perpetrators, Jewish. To them, no choice was ever possible. And then the paper talks about French courts and crimes against humanity and unduly restrictive readings of the Nuremberg definition. OK. Uh, time to wrap it up. Um, the paper goes on to. Uh, look at the decision of the Cour de Cassation, which made a strict and restrictive reading of the Nuremberg Charter, interpreting the Nuremberg definition as requiring for a crime to be qualified as a crime against humanity, that that crime be committed in the name of a state practicing a policy of ideological supremacy. In other words, what was, what was merely a statutory jurisdictional limitation at Nuremberg was in, erroneously interpreted by the French court as a definitional requirement. Practically speaking, this meant that there could be no crimes against humanity outside the very specific context of the Second World War. And the paper goes on to explain that this meant that Vichy France's ideology was safe from scrutiny, limited basically to Nazi ideology. Um, and there were cases that were decided in this way. And uh, she goes on to argue that in a rather clever twist, the Cour de Cassation managed to shield Vichy France and its anti-Semitic policy from judicial scrutiny. Uh, it found, uh, in this case, this uh, gentleman Tuvier guilty of complicity of crimes against humanity for having murdered pursuant to the orders of the Gestapo, an organization belonging to the state practicing a policy of ideological hegemony namely Nazi Germany. Uh, and then she discusses another case, uh, concluding that, that, that it amounted to a bad faith assertion that Vichy High civil servants were not aware of Nazi genocidal enterprise. Uh, and it was another affirmation that enabled French courts to once again preserve Vichy France from any accusation of active participation in the Nazi final solution. At best, Vichy, Vichy France could only be deemed responsible for complicity in illegal arrests and arbitrary confinements. 
And with the entry into the force of the new penal code in France, French law now encapsulates a more general definition of crimes against humanity, deprived of any nexus requirement to the European Axis powers or to the Second World War. Um, and she goes on to discuss the judicial reluctance uh, to apply the new penal code. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, we don't have time here to, to here, she dis discusses the case of Rwanda in the French courts. But we will be, uh, we hope, publishing a collection of these papers, so I hope you'll have an opportunity in the future to read to her, her full paper. And I'll just end with her concluding remarks. French courts' reluctance to adjudicate international crimes affects both the implementation of the law of genocide and that of crimes against humanity. In a sense, this is not that surprising since French law has traditionally understood genocide as a crime against humanity. If France was ultimately among the states supporting the adoption of the Genocide Convention, it is worth recalling that this had not always been the case. In preparation for the debate on the Sec Secretariat's draft of a convention on the crime of genocide, France had circulated a memorandum on the subject of genocide and crimes against humanity, which challenged the very use of the term genocide. France preferred to approach the problem of external extermination of racial, social, political, and religious groups from the standpoint of crimes against humanity. During the second session of the General Assembly, the heart of the issue was whether to consider genocide as a variety of crime against humanity or to treat it as a distinct form of criminal behavior. During the debates, France was the most insistent about the linkage between genocide and crimes against humanity, while others firmly believed that the concept had to be made distinct. France had urged that the preamble describe genocide as a crime against humanity, but this was rejected by the committee, which chose instead to char characterize genocide as a crime against mankind. The French New Penal Code itself expressly includes a section entitled Crimes Against Humanity and Against Persons, which first, the article of which defines genocide as other crimes against humanity. The inclusion of genocide within crimes against humanity in the text of the law might have incited and encouraged courts to favor the qualification of crimes against humanity over that of genocide. In a way, it may have fostered their reluctance to use the qualification of genocide even in cases, in cases of genocide. Yet the judicial reluctance is not confined solely to the crime of genocide and the different judgments related to international crimes issued by French courts show an equal disinclination toward crimes against humanity at least where French interests seem to be at stake. So, uh, we are about eight minutes ahead of time. Now, I understand from uh, whispers from Marta here before she delivered the paper that it may not be apposite to have a coffee break now because the coffee may not yet have been delivered. I think we're checking on that right at this very moment. So uh, can we, while we deal with the air conditioning situation, can anyone have a look at that? Yeah, it's like I'm in Australia at the moment and high summer. And uh, before the windows were open, these doors were open, that's um, Soviet style air conditioning strategy to open the window. So it's fitting for a Ukrainian conference. Yeah, yeah. Well, Andre, you should take off your sweater. You know, yeah, but um, we'll find out about the coffee situation. So the, if it's not yet delivered, uh, we have two ways of proceeding. One is I deliver my comment, which is actually a separate paper, in which I thread through some, some of the paper's insights. Uh, or we have a round one of a discussion before, and then I give my comment in the, the panel afterwards. But I, I have a feeling we should actually move to a more interactive mode because uh, not that you're like undergraduates, but we all know that if you sit there passively for an hour, well, okay, so problem solved. So uh, problem solved. So shall we meet back here as scheduled at quarter past? We have a longer break. See you then.